Chapter 45 Sugar Thieves I can hardly remember the last week of August, and trying to is like catching a dream after you've woken up, then you can already feel it slipping away. One day stands out though because it's when Sam and I saw the sugar thieves for the first time. It was the weekend and Pop had given us money to ride down to the shops on Ocean Beach Road and buy some bread and milk. He still wasn't driving, Annika had stayed in bed, and Luca was working odd hours. He hadn't been back to the haven since Drumlin. Sam and I were putting the groceries in our baskets and were about to snap our helmets back on when we saw Mojame and Arta on the other side of the street. I elbowed Sam and we both stood there and stared at two of them as they were joined by a few more other Haven kids. What are they doing? Sam asked. Mergeme, Arta and their friends had stopped right beside Mr. McMillan's Pram Stop Cafe, all of them on rented bikes from Max. As we watched them, Mergeme and a boy about her age hopped off their bikes while two of their friends kept hold of them and waited. Mergeme and the boy crept towards the Pram Stop and then ducked into a crab walk once they got to the big front window so nobody inside could see them. It had been a cool August day and the sky a constant grey and looking like it might break into rain clouds at any minute. Mr. McMillan had set up his steel outdoor furniture, but all his customers were sitting indoors just to be safe. As we watched, Mergeme and her friend crab walked past the windows. The boy went to the glass front door and peered in and he waved at Mergeme. We watched her creep towards the tables until, Is that allowed? Sam said. I guess it's not technically stealing if they're free, I replied. Mergeme reached a hand up to the little canister in the middle of the first table. It was filled with thin blue packets of sugar. She grabbed hold of it and then hid under the table as she emptied the canister into her hand. She did this to every table until by the end she had a fistful of sugar sachets and each cafe table had empty canisters placed back. Then we watched Mejame and the boy crab walk back to their friends who seemed to be fizzing with excitement as they waved at them to hurry back to their bikes. Mejame dumped her sugar into the basket on the front of her bike and it was only as she took hold of both handles that she thought to look around and then she saw us, the only people on Main Street to have seen them. When she threw her arm in the air and waved to us, Sam and I could only give a little wave back, probably with both our mouths hanging open. And then she was on her bike and all five of them were turning around and racing up Ocean Beach Road, their long hair whipping and tangling behind them in the wind. Let's follow them, I said. Jeff said to come home straight away from the shops. I kicked my kickstand back and got on my bike and then looked at Sam over my shoulder. What's waiting for us at home? Sam's face told me he knew exactly what that there was. Annika in her room crying and Pop getting tired from limping around the house, trying to do all the grown-up chores by himself while Luca was off at work and not back up in, until late again. With the click of Sam's helmet, we headed off. They rode away from the main beach that faced Port Phillip Bay and down Ocean Beach Road to the other side of the Peninsula Strip and the beaches on the Bass Strait side. I didn't know if they knew we were following behind or just didn't care, but they had a little Arta with them and another younger girl, so they weren't pedalling fast enough to outpace us. After 10 minutes or so we reached Sorrento Back Beach. In summer, it's so popular with locals and tourists that you can hardly fit your towel on the sand. Mejame and her friends stopped. As we watched, Mejame dipped into her bike basket and passed out a sugar packet to each of them. They tore the, sa the sachets open tipped their heads back and trickled the sugar into their mouths. The group let out a burst of giggles and Sam and I smiled too. Once the sugar rush hit, Mergeme turned around to look straight at us and her friends followed her gaze. This way! She yelled and then she scooped the air with her arm, inviting us along as they all kicked off and pedalled again. Sam and I looked at each other. It had been 10am when we'd left to get the groceries and we were meant to come straight back. Hello! One of Mejame's riders yelled as they raced away. Hello, hello, hello. Arta and the others echoed. I shrugged. Don't you want to see where they go? Sam nodded. And so, we followed. But it's too cold to swim, Sam said as we pedalled past Coppin's lookout. We were headed away from the popular Sorrento back beach and onto the dirt track that ran alongside the coast. Down that way wasn't as popular with tourists, so there was no easy access for cars, only bike tracks and walking trails. We bumped along the uneven ground, keeping the five Haven kids in our sights. They stopped by the long stretch of wooden railing, got off and lent their bikes there. Then Mejame scooped the rest of the sugar from her basket and led the way along the long wooden staircase to the beach below. 
It's too cold, right? Sam said again as we skidded our bikes to a stop right by theirs. They shouldn't. It's not patrolled until December, I said. But besides, it'll be low tide now anyway. Sam and I hung our helmets on our bike's handlebars and raced to the top of the staircase. What is that? Sam sounded just a little amazed. That is the Sphinx Rock, I said. The Sphinx Rock is exactly like it sounds, a rock formation jutting out low from the coastal cliffs that looks just like Egypt's Great Sphinx of Giza. It has paws outstretched and a face like a slightly broken nose pointing towards Bass Strait. It's separated from the shore by those jutting cliffs and a little way out of the way, but it's a good place to go exploring which is what Mergeme and her friends did that day. All along the beach are beautiful limestone arches and stone walkways formed by old cliffs that have fallen into the ocean. At low tide you can walk all around them and peer into the rock pools to see the shallow world and ocean traps there by day. But when King Tide hits it all gets washed away. The whole place goes back underwater and even the Sphinx rock is drowned. It's nicer in summer, I said, just as a gust of wind slapped us in the face. I lifted my hoodie over my jumper to cover my head. We'll all come down here and hang out. Sam turned to me and gave a little lopsided smile. Even me? Of course, I said. He looked back down to where Mergeme, Arta and their friends were darting around the rock pools and throwing their heads back to pour sugar down their gobs. Do you want to go down? He said. I remembered what Mr. Curry had said about the Haven kids, thinking this place was paradise. I could see how where we lived must have seemed so magical and perfect to them, compared to the conflict and destruction in their country. But right then, even though this place was like paradise, Sam and I really weren't in the mood for exploring or playing. Nah, let's leave them, I said. We watched for a few more seconds as two of the boys balanced on slippery rocks to make their way to the wide tide pool that was probably full of starfish. Mergeme and Arta looked up at us, but we pointed behind us to explain that we had to get going. Mum would like it here, Sam said suddenly. Next time we come back, we'll bring her, yeah? Yeah, I said. We'll bring Annika. Pop and Luca too. My nose and cheeks were starting to tingle from all the salt and sand and wind. As I sniffed and I brought my sleeve up to rub my nose, Sam said something I couldn't quite hear. I had to turn and ask him to say it again. I said, it wasn't too bad a day today for my birthday. I stared at him, my mouth hanging open. What do you mean, your birthday? Today is, he said and shrugged. 29th of August. I thought back to the night before and this morning, to Annika staying in her room, and Pop doing chores and Luca at work and Sam not saying a single thing. Not one word about today being his birthday. What just turned 11 kid does that? What kid can hold it in and not make a week long event out of their birthday? And then I had another sinking feeling. Did, did your dad ring you yet? Is he coming down? Sam adjusted his glasses and brought his sleeve up to wipe his red nose. Nah, mum would have had to remind him. He's bad with stuff like that. Sam didn't need to say any more. We both knew why Sam's birthday had slipped down his mind. I looked at the Haven kids jumping over the rock pools down below and then back to Sam. We could go down if you wanted to hang out for a bit. But Sam shook his head. It's okay. Let's just ride back. He put one foot on the pedal ready to kick off and then looked over his shoulder at me. But Fred? Yeah? Don't say anything to my mum about forgetting. Okay? I nodded. It's just a dumb birthday. I winced when he said that but followed after him when he pushed off the ground and started pedaling. I didn't say anything when we got home either. Annika was still in her room, Pop in his flat and Luca not yet back from work. Nobody asked us where we'd been because they didn't even know we'd been gone, and nobody wished Sam a happy birthday, not once, not at all. So I knocked on his door that night. Yeah? I went inside and closed it behind me, keeping my hands behind my back. He was lying on his stomach in bed, playing on his old Game Boy Pocket. Pretty crap birthday, hey, I said. He sat up and shrugged. Eh, at least it's nearly over now. Just as Sam predicted, his dad hadn't called either, so I could see why he'd rather f just forget the whole thing. Well, before it is over, I just wanted to give you this. I pulled my hands out from behind my back and thrust the parcel at him. It was covered in newspaper, the closest thing to wrapping paper I could find around the house. Sam got off his bed to take the parcel from me. I hadn't even used sticky tape. So I watched as Sam unfolded the newspaper to reveal the two books within. He read from the covers. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Then he turned the books over and over again, looking at them brightly drawn covers with a red train on one and what looked like a flying blue car on the other. 
They're brand new, promise. I got the first one ages ago, but never read it. And the bookstore had the second one, and when Pop went a few weeks ago with me, I bit my bottom lip, watching Sam turn the books over again and trace the fat lettering of the names with his fingertip. I worried that he'd think it was silly, or maybe he'd even get more upset that I was gifting him books I'd bought for myself and was passing off to him. Look inside, I said, and then instantly regretting it. In case he wasn't the type of person to write in books. To Sam, he read. Happy 11th birthday, love Fred, 1999. I also blushed when he read the love bit, but I wrote it in the first one without really thinking, and then just did the same for the second book too. See, they're properly yours. And because my pop has this idea that books should look loved and have little marks in them to remind you of when you first read them. Does that make sense? He always writes that in the top corner of the books he gives me for my birthdays and Christmas, and it always makes me happy to remember how they came to me, and to see his writing when I opened them again. Fred, I took a deep breath. Yeah? Thank you. You're welcome, Sam, I said. Happy birthday. Thank you.